Now we're going home. There's a rest beyond. There's relief from every care. In a little while we're going home. And no tears shall fall in the city bright and fair. In a little while we're going home. In a little while. In a little while, we shall cross the billows foam. We shall meet at last when the stormy winds are past. In a little while, we're going home. Don't we look forward to that? Oh, well. I do. Very fitting, Sylvia. Thank you so much. Oh, Igor and family. You know, I'm not going to try and pronounce your last name. Huh? He keeps trying to tell me how to say it, but I my tongue won't wrap around it very well.
taste of heaven you think maybe we can all be a great family singing together in one accord then too David please bring us our message good evening everyone all right so what we're going to get into this evening is um, we're going to get into some of what we've already got into, but we're going to kind of go over a little bit, and then we're going to go into more. And um, yeah, this is, uh, this is a very deep study, but also um, I believe that God has given us answers, and He's given us light in regards to this time. And before I get into this, I really want to pray and ask the Father, the heavenly angels, to be sent to us. <clears throat> our dearest heavenly father i know that um we can do all things through christ who strengthens us and father i just thank you father for the words that you want to speak through me tonight i just ask you father to do your will through me let me be your vessel let me be the one who gives gives this message tonight father i know uh of myself i feel very weak but I know that with you, I can truly do all things. And Father, that you are going to work tonight and that you want a, to give a special message to the people. So I pray also for everybody in this audience tonight. I pray, Father, that our ears are open, that we're ready to get into the Word. We're ready to open our Bibles. And Father, that we're ready to look at the things that are coming to pass and that have come to pass so that we can truly understand what time we are living in. And Father, I just pray all these things in the name of your precious Son, who's paid the price for us. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so everybody can open their Bibles to, do, to uh, Daniel chapter 12. Daniel chapter 12, kind of where we left off the other night. And um, I had a chart on the wall here that everybody could see, and I brought out the 70 weeks, the 2300 days, 1290, 1335, and the 1260. And there's a quote here, and I'm going to quote Ellen White, but I do not want any of us to base our doctrines on Ellen White unless the Bible says it first. We should always prove things from the Bible first. And um, this is a quote from her, because, and the reason that I'm using this quote is because I think we've went off and I misunderstood a lot of things. And so I did show a lot of this from the Bible the other night, but I want to also just um, show you that this was taught to us many years ago and that we went off. But in the Testimonies to Ministers, page 115, it says, Daniel stood in his lot to bear his testimony, which was sealed until the time of the end, when the first angel's message should be proclaimed to our world. So according to this quote, when was the, do you guys know when the first angel's message was proclaimed to the world? About 1844. And what does she say? The time, it was the time of the end here, right? So are we waiting for the time of the end or have we been in the time of the end for a long, long time? 
Right, we have. And it says, Daniel stood in his lot. Does anybody know where that's written in the Bible? Daniel 12. Thank you very much. Daniel 12. It's in Daniel 12. In verse 13, it says, Go thou thy way till the end be, for thou shalt rest and stand in thy lot at the end of the days. The end of which days? Anybody know which days? We're going to go through this chapter again. We went through it the other night, but I want to review it because we want to know what the end of these days are where Daniel would stand in his lot. Let's go to Daniel chapter 12 and verse 4. And let's read it. It says, Thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. So when does this point to when the book was sealed to? There's a lot of different answers, I think, I hear. Well, let's keep reading. It says, Then I, Daniel, looked, and behold, there stood other two, one on the one side of the bank, the other on that side of the bank of the river. And one said to the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, how long shall it be to the end of these wonders? And there's an answer. I heard the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, when he held up his right hand and his left hand to heaven. And what does he do? Swear by him that liveth forever and ever. Those are key words. Swear by him that liveth forever and ever. And he holds his hands. He's standing on the bank of the river that it shall be for time, times, and half, when he shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people, all these things shall be finished. Now, if we're familiar with the time, times, and half prophecy, that has to do with the dark ages. That has to do with when the power of the holy people was truly scattered. And he says in verse 8, he says, I heard, Daniel heard the time, times, and half a time. He, he had the answer. But he said, I understood not... And remember what we were talking about last, the other night? Something that we were to know, therefore, and understand. He understood a lot of things. There were things that were to be sealed up till the end, though. And he says, Oh, my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? So isn't he asking something similar to what he just asked in verse 5? He asked, How long shall it be till the end of these wonders, right? Or verse 6, sorry. And so he's asking the same question. And he said, Go thou thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. Many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. So what are the wise going to understand? These time prophecies and when the time of the end is, right? Now, Verse 11, it says, From the time that the daily shall be taken away and the abomination that maketh desolate set up, there shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety days. Now, does everybody remember this chart the other night? Okay, so when was, the, when was the abomination of desolation set up and the daily taken away? What year was that? 508, right. When King Clovis was given the power of the, the state power gave its power to the church and then it uprooted the Visigoths. And so there was 1,290 days of total domination of the state with the church power. And that lasted until 1798 when that domination over the people was taken away. And so there's one more. It says, Blessed is he that waiteth and cometh to the 1,335 days. And we talked about what happened in 1843, 45 years later, which was, Blessed are they that read and understand the words of the prophecy. What's a key word that I'm using here? Understand. Because what are we talking about here? We're talking about the wicked shall not, what? But the wise shall understand so who's going to understand this at the time of the end the wise in 1843 the wise are going to understand that the book of daniel is unsealed and so it says blessed is he that cometh to the 1335 days verse 12 blessed is he that understands the words of the prophecy because what happened at the end of the 1335 days it says, verse 13, Go thou thy way till the end be, 
For thou shalt rest and stand in thy lot at the end of the 1,335 days. So what happened in 1843 was Daniel was standing in his lot. Now let's go back and read this again. Daniel stood in his lot to bear his testimony, which was sealed to the time of the end when the first angel's message should be proclaimed to our world. So do we understand all this chapter now as we're reading it? I hear a lot of silence. Let's go to Daniel cha or Revelation chapter 10. Revelation chapter 10. The wise shall understand. Revelation chapter 10 verse 1. <clears throat> It says, And I saw another angel, mighty angel, come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head, his face as it were as a sun, his feet as a pillar of fire. And he had in his hand a little book. And what was the book? Open, right? The book of Daniel, right? Thank you very much. And he set his right foot upon the sea and his left foot upon the earth. Does that sound familiar? Daniel 12, right? And then he cried with a loud voice when a lion roareth, and when he cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. And when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write, and I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered, and write them not. Well, there were some things that were sealed. But what about now? Are they still sealed? Well, let's keep reading. Verse 5. The angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth, lifted up his hand to heaven. Does that sound familiar? That's Daniel, right? And he swear by him that liveth forever and ever. Does that sound familiar? Who created the heavens, the earth that therein are, and the earth and the things that are therein, and the sea and the things that are therein, that there should be time no longer? Well, what did he swear by him in Daniel chapter 12? He swear by him, he saith that it shall be until times, times, and half a time. And then he gets down to the 1290, and then he gets to the 1335, and then he says there shall be time no longer. Now, this is interesting. We've got 1844 here, where it's the end of the 2300 days. But when you read about this quote in the book, Ellen White's Second Selected Messages, he says that the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth, lifted up his hand to heaven, swear by him that liveth forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that are therein, and the earth and the things that are therein, and the sea and the things that are therein, that there should be time no longer. This message announces the end of the prophetic periods. So what happened in 1844? The end of the prophetic periods. What prophetic periods? There we go. All of them. The disappointment of those who expected to see our Lord in 1844 was indeed bitter to those who had so ardently looked for his appearing. Now let's read a little bit more here. It says that there should be time no longer. So what does that mean? It's the end of prophetic periods. And then verse, let's read verse 7. And it says, But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished as he had declared to his servants the prophets. Now, when does the seventh angel start to sound? Go to chapter 11, verse 15 for a second, and it says, And the seventh angel sounded, and there were voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. So when does the seventh angel sound? In chapter 11, verse 15. Now, if you're looking at your Bibles, you're going to see that if the seventh angel begins to sound in 1844, then what does that mean about the sixth angel? It's past, right? And you can read about the sixth angel if you go back a few verses and you read the rest of the woes and all that stuff, and you can go right down to verse 2 and 3 where it says, The court which is without the temple, leave out, measure it not, for it is given to the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. So what happened during the sixth trumpet? The 42 months, time, times, and half a time, right? So that's already done, the sixth trumpet. So what time are we in now? We're in the time of the seventh trumpet. How long have we been in the time of the seventh trumpet? 
since at least 1844, it began to sound in 1844. So that means it must be sounding over a period of time. Right? It's what the Bible is teaching us. Verse 8, And the voice which I heard from heaven spake unto me again and said, Go and take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel which stands upon the sea and the earth. And verse 9 says, then Revelation 10, 9. Did I say the right chat, right book? Revelation 10, verse 9, sorry. Revelation 10, verse 9. So let me read verse 7 again. It says, In the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished. So he begins to sound when time, the end of time prophecies comes. And the voice which I heard from heaven spake to me again and said, Go and take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel which stands upon the sea and upon the earth. And I went to the angel and said to him, Give me the little book. And he said to me, Take it, eat it up. It shall make thy belly bitter, but it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey and i took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up and it was in my mouth sweet as honey and as soon as i had eaten it my belly was bitter so what does ellen white say that referred to the disappointment of those who expected to see our lord in 1844 was indeed what's the word there bitter to those who had so ardently looked for his appearing they had a misunderstanding of what was going to happen in 1844 did they understand the time prophecies, though? They did. They did. Now, verse 11 says, He said to me, Thou must prophesy again before many peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. If you remember the quote we read before, let's go back here. It says, When this book was unsealed at the time of the end, the first angel's message should be proclaimed to our world. Let's just take a look at the first angel's message. Remember, it says, Thou must prophesy again. Before many peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. Revelation 14, verse 6. The first angel's message. And it says, I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to them that dwell on the earth, to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people saying with a loud voice, Fear God, give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come. So what happened in 1844? Yes, as we remember, we learned that yesterday. We talked about Michael going in, the, or Jesus going in the most holy place and standing before the Father in 1844, the cleansing of the sanctuary at the end of the 2300 days. The hour of His judgment has come in 1844. That was the time of the end. That's when the prophecies come to an end in Daniel in Revelation chapter 10, verse 5 and 6. That there should be time no longer. It's the end of the prophetic periods. And then the first angel begins to sound. Now, she said that I have seen the 1843 chart was directed by the hand of the Lord and that it should not be altered. That the figures were as he wanted them, that his hand was over and hit a mistake in some of the figures so that none could see it until his hand was removed. So there was two charts here. One was an, 18, an earlier chart, which had one of a mistake in the chart, which caused some of the figures to be off. Does anybody know what the mistake was? The zero year. And that would have caused some of the figures to be off. But that's all that was wrong with the chart, right? Okay. But it says, when union existed before 1844, nearly all were united on the correct view of the daily. But in the confusion since 1844, other views have been embraced and darkness and confusion have followed. And what she say here, time has not been a test since 1844 and it will never again be a test. So we shouldn't be predicting, you know, all these 2024 Jesus coming, stuff like that, right? That's not, you, you can't use these time prophecies to do that. But some people are. But this is saying nearly all were correct on the view of the daily. Now, were they all correct on what the daily was? No, because they didn't understand even, they said it was a pagan sanctuary, all that kind of stuff. It had nothing to do. The sanctuary, they were wrong on what the sanctuary was. They thought it was the earth and all kinds of things. But with what they were correct on was time. It says time has not been a test here, right? They were correct according to the times. And what happened in 508? 
theological victory for the bishops of Rome. They destroyed the Visigoths. So the time of 508, when the daily took place, was correct. And everybody was united in this view. But since that time, what's happened? Confusion has taken place, right? What's another word for confusion? How about Babylon, right? You know what, what Babylon does to these charts? I'm going to get it out in a second. But um, she says, I saw they were correct in their reckoning of the prophetic periods. Prophetic time closed in 1844. And Jesus entered the most holy place to cleanse the sanctuary at the ending of the days. This is very important to understand. So that we know where we are in the book of Daniel chapter 11. Because we're going to get down to the last verses as we're going through this. Now, there's something important here. She said, their faith was greatly strengthened by the direct and forcible application of those scriptures which set forth a tarrying time. As early as 1842, the Spirit of God moved upon Charles Fitch to devise the prophetic chart, which was generally regarded by Adventists as a fulfillment of the command given by the prophet Habakkuk to write the vision and make it plain upon tables. So what does these charts have all on them? They have all the dates, right? 508, the 1290, the 1260, the 2300, right? So what would bring confusion in is moving all these dates. That would start to confuse the people, wouldn't it? Go with me in your Bibles to Habakkuk chapter 2. Habakkuk chapter 2. Please turn in your Bibles with me. This is very important. I want us all to truly examine this. Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 2. I know it's a hard one to find. It's after Nahum. Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 2. It's before Sephaniah. Now it says, The Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain upon tables that he may run that readeth it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time. Now what's, does anybody remember Daniel when I was talking about the appointed time? What's the word, what do you guys think the word was there? Moed, right. And what happened at the end of the 2300 days? When did it end? On what day? The day of atonement, right. A Moed, right. And God said it's an appointed time. It's a time appointed. It's a Moed. But at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. Now, the words here say, write the vision. Make it plain upon tables, so that when we see it, we can run when we read it and understand it. So we've got the tables, the two charts, she says, was a fulfillment of these tables. Now, what's happened since? Confusion was brought in, right? We've had different views with respect to the daily, 508, 538, the 1260, 1290, 1335. Not a lot of people understand these things anymore. Confusion has come in. Where does confusion come from? Yeah, go with me to Isaiah 28. Isaiah chapter 28. Isaiah 28 and verse 7 we're going to look at. <clears throat> now in Isaiah 28 verse 7 it says they have also erred through wine so what's the problem here you know when you go to the bar too much sometimes it blurs your vision right when you go to Babylon too much guess what happens it blurs your vision you need the vision to be able to run if you have no vision you might be wobbling tripping and falling and so this is what they have erred through is the wine, drinking too much wine. And it says, and through strong drink are out of the way. The priest and the prophet have erred through strong drink. They are swallowed up of wine. They are out of the way through strong drink. They err in vision. They stumble in judgment. And then it says, for what? All tables are full of vomit and filthiness so that there is no place clean. Now, if we were to write a vision and make it plain upon tables... And we had the tables laid out in front of us, and then we drink a bunch of wine, we get really sick, and then we vomit all over the tables. Is anybody going to be able to see the 1260, 1290, and 1335 there? No. 
And then what happens is that different ideas start coming in that bring in confusion. And what's going on with God's body right now? We're bringing a lot of the wine of Babylon in and we're getting drunk and there's vomit on the tables and we can't see when the daily really take place. How many of us are being able to explain these things today? See, that's what's happening is that we've been reading and drinking a lot of the wine that's in Babylon. We're learning from them. They're bringing it in, whether it be through different movements or whatever, we're bringing it in. And so we're getting drunk and we're not able to understand and not able to run. We have to have these tables clean. These tables need to be cleaned off. Verse 9 says, Whom shall he teach knowledge and whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breasts. For precept must be upon precept, line upon line, here a little, there a little. And what are we doing? We're going here a little. We're understanding these prophecies and they open up to us. We go to the book of Revelation. We go to the book of Daniel and they unlock each other. So now, as we're going through these things, we can start to unlock the whole prophetic chart. And we can get right down to where we are right now, which is in the time of the end. We're in the time of the end. Now I want to go to Daniel chapter 11. Daniel chapter 11. And we're going to start with verse 31. And I know we're going over this again, but you know what? It says in uh, 2 Peter 1.19, it's necessary to bring these things to our remembrance that we might be established in present truth. So we better bring these things to our remembrance again so that we truly get established in present truth. So Daniel chapter 11. Because if we're going to depend on someone else to teach us these things, guess where we might end up? Drinking the wine of Babylon. And it's happening a lot. It's happening a lot because we're not established in present truth. Now, Daniel 11:31 says, Arms shall stand on his part. They shall pollute the sanctuary of strength. shall take away the daily, and they shall place the abomination that maketh desolate. Has that happened already? Has it happened? 508 AD, right? We've definitely done this. This has already happened. Clovis, the fulfillment, 508 AD. Abomination. Now, were all our pioneers in agreement on this issue? They were. So what's happened since then? Confusion has come in. Wine of Babylon. Now, verse 32 says, Such as do wickedly against the covenant shall he corrupt by flatteries. But the people that know their God shall be strong and do exploits. And we've read a lot of this already. Now, verse 36, it says, The king shall do according to his will. He shall exalt himself, magnify himself above every god, and shall speak marvelous things against the god of gods, and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished, for that that is determined shall be done. Now, there's a lot of people that believe that this is France. I don't believe that. I believe this is the papacy. Speaks marvelous things against the god of gods. Speaks great words against the Most High. It's Daniel 7.25. He rules for time, times, and half a time. And he exalts another God. Verse 39 says, Thus shall he do in the most strongholds with a strange God. Daniel 11, 39. And we've been over this. Whom he shall acknowledge and increase with glory. We went over what happened in 508 and 538. So we should be clear on what this is referring to. It's referring to the Dark Ages. He used the Trinity. It was the state law that anybody didn't worship, they'd be put to death. That was church and state. Abomination. Now, verse 40 says, And at the time of the end shall the king of the south push at him. And who's the king of the south? Well, when we look at it carefully, it was Egypt, right? But we read, Dan we read Revelation 11 the other day, and right at the time, times and half a time, there was a power that came against the papacy in 1798. And that was, that was France, right? Which is spiritually Sodom and Egypt, right? Sodom and Egypt. So it says, At the time of the end shall the king of the south push at him, at the papacy. But the king of the... It says, The king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind, with chariots, with horsemen, with many ships, and he shall enter into countries and shall overflow and pass over. Now, the word come against him is not in the original. It's not really there. It really is saying that the king of the north would come like a whirlwind, with chariots. And when you... 
In Bible prophecy, what is a whirlwind symbolic of? Does anybody know what whirlwind symbolizes? It's war. Thank you very much. War. And what do you need to make war? You need armies, chariots, horsemen, ships, armies. So what is the king of the north going to get at the end? Armies, state, state power. So what's going to be repeated? The same thing that happened in 508 is repeated here again in verse 40. So after 1798, at some point, the king of the north is going to get armies. And he's going to get state power again. And he's going to make war. And who's he going to make war with? God's people, the remnant of her seed. You know, the dragon makes war with the remnant of her seed. And what does the dragon have on his head? Ten horns, right? Horns. What are those symbol symbolize? Kings of the earth, kingdoms. Ten horns. Okay, so what is this? When he's going to get armies, what is this really symbolizing? Well, I want you to hold your Bible here in Daniel 11. We're going to go back and forth a little bit. In Revelation 17, verse 16, It says that the ten horns which you saw upon the beast, they shall hate the whore and shall make her desolate and naked, shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. Now Jesus said there was to be a sign of the end. And I'm going to come to this as we go, but these ten horns are going to make her desolate. There's an abomination here, church and state. And this is what makes the whore desolate. But there was one that happened in 508. And you know what? There's one more to happen at the end of time. They're going to come against them. They're going to get chariots, horsemen, and ships. Now, some of you might not, might not remember what happened a few years ago, but in 2014, on May 13th, 2014, French foreign minister, um, I can't remember his name, Fat, Laurent Fabius, he said, we have 500 days to avoid climate chaos. Does anybody remember this? A lot of us were familiar, and we were waiting for what was coming, and guess what came in 500 days? Well, Pope Francis addressed the UN 500 days after he said that in the United States, calling for peace and environmental justice. And who's he going to use to enforce justice? He needs a state power. And so who's he addressing here? The United Nations. You know, we're told by historians that before the destruction of Jerusalem took place, that a sign was given to the early Christians to flee out of the midst of the city. Come out of her, my people. Because what was going to happen to the city? It was going to be burned with fire, wasn't it? Now what's happening in this last day? There's a call. Come out. When he referred to the destruction of Jerusalem, his prophetic words reached beyond that event to the final conflagration in that day when the Lord shall rise out of his place to punish the world for their iniquity. And where's that written? Where he talks about a final destruction of Jerusalem and of the world. What shall be the sign of the end or the sign of the destruction and the sign of the end of the world? Matthew 24. That's right. So there's to be, what happened in Jerusalem was something that was to happen to the whole world at the end. So we have to recognize the same sign that they had to recognize in 66 AD. There was a sign given to them. Now, when he came to the vat, when he came to the United Nations in New York City, September 25th, there was a flag raised at the, Vat at the United Nations. And it's a Vatican flag. It's a religious flag. It's not, a, it's not just any kind of nation here. This is a church, right? And, you know, they want to institute what is called Agenda 21. I've talked about this before, and this is important. This is not just some. But basically, Agenda 21 is to revamp the United States and remap it. And I talked about this before. This is very important to understand. They want to move you into the cities. And God's call for his people is what? Out of the cities, right, out. Now, when, when the papacy tries to get control over the state and it enforces buy and sell decrees, is it going to be very hard living in the cities? Yeah. So if we see a sign beforehand, he probably wants us not to miss it. You know, if he's telling us, hey, you guys better get out before the destruction comes, Right? Did they, did, they have the, did they have the sign before destruction came to Jerusalem? So should we be waiting till destruction comes and then all of a sudden say, okay, it's time to get out? Too late. Too late. Now, you don't want to wait till that's happening in the cities. And this looks like a lot of Chinese people here. 
it really is a UN army. It's a United Nations army. Now, they're going to come against God's people. And when Pope Francis came to the United States on September 25th, to 23rd, 24th, 25th, whatever it was, 2015, you'll notice what this trip was called. It says, Pope Francis' visit to the United States. A whirlwind papal journey concludes. Now, do you guys remember reading about a whirlwind? And what was the whirlwind? What was he gathering in this whirlwind? What would he get? Armies, right. And what kind of armies is he getting here? East Coast prepares for whirlwind visit from Pope Francis, Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. It's pretty interesting that they're saying the same thing, isn't it? CBS New York, Pope's whirlwind New York tour comes to an end. That's not enough, right? Three of them, three sites doing it. How about Fox 6, whirlwind trip, Pope Francis back in Rome. Whirlwind trip. Do you think he came like a whirlwind when he came in 2015? Maybe uh, USA Today, Vatican, Pope Francis is tired after whirlwind, limping a bit, but doing fine. Are you getting it? For Pope Francis, a whirlwind tour of New York City. And what did he do in New York City? What did he gather? Did he gather ships, chariots, armies? Isn't that what he was here for? To enforce environmental justice? You need state power to enforce justice, right? So a whirlwind tour of New York City winds down at Madison Square Garden. That's a Wall Street Journal. Eyewitness News 7, Pope Francis' whirlwind visit to disrupt transportation and business. Uh, Watch It News, Pope leaves New York City in a whirlwind of events. CBS News New York, Pope whirlwind New York City trip. It was a whirlwind trip. And you know what's interesting about this? It happened on the Day of Atonement, Judgment Day, 2015. You know, when he comes to get state power, church and state is uniting. Now, as we're looking at this, verse 40, it says in Daniel 11, at the time of the end, shall the king of the south push at him, and the king of the north shall come like a whirlwind with chariots, horsemen, Many ships he shall enter into the country, shall overflow and pass over. She'll enter into the glorious land, and many countries shall be overthrown. I'm going to get to the glorious land in a sec. But these shall escape out of his hand, Edom, Moab, chief of Ammon. And I don't, I don't want to go into those right now. It's just, it's, it's a lot of rabbit trails, and I don't want to get into everything here. But there's different kinds of beliefs and different kinds of religious systems. He shall stretch forth his hand upon the countries, and the land of Egypt shall not escape. Now, what does Egypt symbolize again? I believe it symbolizes atheism. And I believe that a lot of them are going to be coming into agreement with the papacy. And it says, but tidings out of the east, verse 44, and out of the north shall trouble him. Therefore, he shall go forth with great fury and to destroy and utterly to make away many. Tidings out of the east. Where's Jesus coming from, Matthew 24? He's the east, right. And, you know, is this going to trouble the papacy? The good news, the gospel. This gospel should go to all the world, and then shall the end come, right. And then what's it say in verse 15 of Matthew 24? When ye shall therefore see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, know therefore and understand. So we better understand it. And so verse 45 says, He shall plant the tabernacles of his palace between the seas and the glorious holy mountain, yet he shall come to his end and none shall help him. Now I'm going I'm to go to this verse shortly and say what it means. But at that time, verse 12, verse 1, at that time shall Michael stand up and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was. So what's about to come? The time of trouble. We're here. We're not waiting for the seven trumpets to be fulfilled. We're not waiting for the rest of Daniel to be fulfilled. We're here right now. Loud cry. This is the final warning to the world. We're here. And you know, it's in front of us. Now, James White on Daniel 11, he said, He shall plant the tabernacles of his palace between the seas and the glorious holy mountain, yet he shall come to his end and none shall help him. Now, who's this referring to here? Verse 45, right? It's said that Palestine is such a glorious land. Now, some people are saying this now, and that the Turkish seat of government is to be removed to that land. I hear a lot of people saying it's going to be Turkey. This is where it's going to be in Jerusalem. 
and Turkey is the king of the north. I don't believe it fits. But he says Palestine, which is over in Jerusalem, has had the curse of God resting upon it ever since the death of the Son of God. But the western continent, America, is now at the time of the fulfillment of the prophecy, just such a land. So what is he saying is the glorious land in this? America, okay. So America would be the glorious land. And if America is the glorious land, now let's just see who he says is the, um, the king of the north. Is it papacy or the turkey? James White in Word to Little Flock said, Michael is a stand up at the time that the last power in Daniel chapter 11 comes to his end and none shall help him. This power is the last that treads down the true church of God. This last power that treads down the saints is brought to view in Revelation 13, 11 to 18. His number is 666. Now, who was James White saying here was the king of the north, the last power in Daniel 11? Who was he saying? It's papacy, right? So I know um, if the papacy is the king of the north and the king of the north is to come into the glorious land, where does he have to come at the time of the end? America, right. So basically, America, the heart of the nation is Washington, D.C., right? And out of the heart proceed the things of the mouth. So if it was ever to speak like a dragon, where would it speak out of? Washington, D.C., right. That's one point. Another point is, in the heart dwells, what's supposed to dwell in the heart? Shekinah glory. God's spirit is supposed to be in there, right? It was a Christian nation. as It was described as a Protestant nation, protested, right? So it was Protestant. So I believe that God was in the heart at first, right? But when God leaves, and then somebody else comes and stands in there, is he not standing in the place where he's not supposed to be? in that beast yeah he's in the heart of the beast right and so he's standing where he ought not to be and if you go to mark 13 14 that's what it says when you see him standing where it ought not no one understand it don't miss it not we could show this five different ways ten different ways but it's it's here it's now and i know a lot of people might be saying no that's not true it's turkey and they're going to wait seven years until they rebuild the temple and rebuild this and have all this other stuff happen it's going to be way, you're going to be waiting forever almost. It's going to be way too late. You're going to be waiting a long time. God is telling us right now it's here, it's now. Go with me to Leviticus chapter 21. Leviticus chapter 21. There's a call when we see this. Leviticus chapter 21. Oh, sorry. Is it Leviticus? Yes, 21 verse 9, sorry. 21 verse 9. Now it says that the daughter of any priest, if she profane herself by playing the whore, she profaneth her father, she shall be burnt with fire. And what happened to Jerusalem in the past? When, after, right. So was the call to come out of her before he was burnt with fire or af after? Yeah, we better get, the, get the, the order right before. So how about Babylon? What's about to happen? The ten horns make her desolate and she shall be burnt with fire. And who's the ten horns? It's the whole world, isn't it? Right? The United Nations? Go with me to Revelation chapter 17. Revelation chapter 17. Everybody in your Bibles, let's go to Revelation chapter 17. This is so important. <clears throat> And we're going to start with verse 1. Verse 1 says, There came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying to me, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. Now, what is the word there? Judgment? Why is it judged again? Verse 2. With whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication. Why is it judged? fornication with the kings of the earth church and state right and what was it doing on judgment day of 2015 fornicating with the kings of the earth right coming into the place where he's not supposed to be into the heart of the nation and he's doing the thing that he's not supposed to we're supposed to recognize this when we see it this is a sign to god's people what shall be the sign of your coming 
and of the end of the world. Ellen White, you read her books, and she says it in Five Testimonies 451. When you see the threefold union, it's going to grab on. And this is like, like what happened in Jerusalem of old. We got to get out before. We don't wait. Remember, he has power over all the silver, over all the gold, and all the precious stones of the earth. No man is going to be able to buy or sell. If we're in the cities at these times when this all comes down, we have our sign now. It's time to heed. And the only reason we're not going to see it is because we've been misled. Remember, what are they doing? What is, what is it bringing in when we start to destroy those charts and destroy the understanding, the proper understanding of the daily? And we try to put it all to the future. Confusion's coming in. Drunk. The tables are full of vomit. Yes, 5T451. Now, verse, chapter 17, verse 2. Now, what is this woman called? Verse 5, it says, Upon her forehead was a name written mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And verse 6 says, I saw the woman drunk with the blood of saints, the blood of martyrs of Jesus, and when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. Now, go down with me, and I... I could go over all the seven kings and stuff like that. I'm not going to go into that. I've done it before. If anybody wants to do a study on it, I can do one later. I'm happy to. But verse 12 says that the ten hordes which you saw are ten kings, which have received no kingdom yet, but received power as kings one hour with the beast. These have one mind. They're united. These kings are united nations. And shall give their power and strength to the beast. These shall make war with the Lamb. What do you need to make war? Armies, that's right. There's a war going on right now, and they're trying to get power over the kings of the earth. And the Lamb shall overcome them, because he is Lord of lords and King of kings. Amen. Verse 15 says, And he saith to me, The waters which I saw where the horse sitteth are peoples, multitudes, and nations, and tongues. And the ten horns which you saw upon the beast shall hate the whore, shall make her desolate. So ten horns make her desolate and then naked and shall eat her flesh and burn the whore with fire. And what happens when she's, what's, what makes her guilty of being burned with fire? Plain the whore. That's what the Bible says in Leviticus 21 verse 9. We've read that already. So we need to understand this is why she's fornicating with the kings of the earth, church and state. It's right before our eyes. There's a sign an abomination, and what does it say in verse 16? That makes her desolate. Don't miss the sign. It's a sign. Because what's the call when we see it? Judgment. What's the judgment? Babylon is fallen, is fallen. Let's go to chapter 18. We'll see the judgment here. Verse, Verse 1, it says, After these things I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen. It's become the habitation of devils, the hold of every foul spirit, a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. Why is she fallen? Verse 3, For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. And the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. Does she have power over the gold, silver, the precious things? This is the king of the north. What is Babylon called in the prophecies? It's called the king of the north, isn't it? It's definitely the king of the north. And so here, there's power over all the, all the money that no man is going to be able to buy or sell. There's still a decree to come. Should we give the call before the decree or after? I believe before, yes. Verse 4. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. And what is about to happen to her? We're told that she sits a queen. She's going to see no sorrow in verse 7. And doesn't it tell, her, tell us in verse 10, Standing afar off for the fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, that great city, that mighty city, for in one hour is her judgment come. And the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her, for no man buyeth their merchandise anymore. And what are they going to watch? They're going to watch the smoke of her burning. And she's burnt because of her guiltiness. Again, Pope begins 39-hour whirlwind visit to New York City. Did we miss that? Did we miss the whirlwind trip that was made to gather chariots, horsemen, all the kings of the earth, right? And he's gathering them. 
Pope's whirlwind tour of New York City, CBS Pittsburgh. You could keep going, right? There's more and more. Just do a Google search. It's all over the internet. We saw it. It happened. Judgment Day. And it's the judgment of the great whore. And for anyone right now, we should be giving a loud cry or we should, we should all be crying out. And I hope we're all going to walk out of here and we're all going to say, this is the times, this is the thing. Ellen White says in early writings, she says that if we understand the time prophecies in the 2300 days, that these things, when we teach these things, these are calculated to unite the flock. So what are we teaching now? We should be teaching these things to each other, to other people, so that we come into unity and we're standing on the firm foundation that was given. And I know that the general conference isn't teaching these things. They don't understand a lot of these things. We have it. We have the, we have the truth about God. We have the feast. We have more, though. We have a lot more. And it's who's going to run. Who's going to run? The tables are full of vomit, but let's clean those tables off right now and let's stop moving all these dates up to the future. Time prophecy is done according to the great controversy. Yeah. So we're in a time now where we're not counting the days. We're giving a loud cry right now and we don't know the day or the hour. We know that Jesus is coming very soon. We know destruction is coming very soon and we need not move these dates into the future. We have to get on the firm foundation of the Advent faith right now and just be able to be of one accord in regards to when the daily happened. When did the daily happen? 508. What happened after that? 1290, 1335, 1843, 1844. All these dates are a firm foundation. And after this, the time of the end. And we've been in the time of the end for a long time. Daniel's standing in his lot. Prophetic time has come to an end. Time shall be no longer. All these things are right there. It's just a matter of us studying them, and getting fluent in them. We should all be fluent in these things. We need to be established in present truth. We need to be giving a prophetic understanding. A line of truth is laid out for all of us to stand on. And I know some might be questioning it right now. And um, I pray that you get your Bibles out and you get the spirit of prophecy out. You get these things out. Go line upon line, precept upon precept. You'll see that the tables are full of vomit and that we've been drinking the wine of Babylon for a long time and we just haven't realized it. And that's why we vomited all over the tables and we moved all those dates. And um, I know it's a serious message and it's a serious time. And I, I am very thankful that I was here to share this message with you. And I hope, I hope to God that we all can stand on this platform together. I hope we can all come to unity and I hope we can all proclaim that now is the time to give a loud cry Come out of her, my people. This is the final warning. It's in Great Controversy, chapter 38. The loud cry. And there's one more chapter to come, and that's the time of trouble. And we've got to be sealed before that comes. And he needs to seal us with his Holy Spirit. Give us the spirit, the love, the joy, the peace, the long-suffering, the gentleness that Jesus had. We can't wait for character perfection. We have to accept it by faith. And it's, his, it's ours to have because his word has given us everything. It's power. It's life. It will do what it says it will do. It's not just telling us to go do these things and not giving us the power to do it with it. So we can claim all these promises. They're precious promises that make us partakers of his divine nature. So as we leave these feasts, this is the last great day. And as we leave, there's water, I believe, that he has to give us. And he wants to flow in here, in the heart. He wants to... Christ to be sitting in here. Not the man of sin, not any other man. He wants us to have that in our hearts. And so as we go, let us all just drink it in. Drink in on the last day of the feast what he's given to us and praise his holy name. Our dearest Heavenly Father, what a blessing it's been to come together as your people. Father, we're all growing, we're all learning, and we've all made mistakes, we've all had misunderstandings. But Father, we know that your word is truth and that it will guide us, your spirit will guide us in all truth. Father, there are many things we have to learn and many, many things we have to unlearn. And we still have a lot to unlearn yet, I'm sure. Father, I know that I know nothing yet as I ought to know. As it says in 1 Corinthians 8, 2, even Paul the Apostle could proclaim that. Father, we do know, though, 
And we do understand, as the Bible says, that there is something that we should, we should truly be founded in. And that is knowing when the abomination of desolation takes place and being able to give a loud cry, flee out of the midst of Babylon, flee out of Judea, flee out of whatever it is, Father, that we might be attached to. Help us, Father, to recognize our spiritual attachments and to detach, to recognize that the devil is making war with the remnant of your seed. And he's trying to attack us. He's trying to destroy us. He's trying to mislead us. He's pouring out of his, his mouth water like a flood. And it's poisonous. It's unclean. It's dirty. And it's polluted. And Father, there is a cleansing that is taking place. You want to cleanse your children of all unclean things. So cleanse us, Father, now of all these things. Let us recognize the things that we've learned during this feast, the hell statutes, the beautiful message that we've been given. Help us, Father, to, to proclaim it to the world, to give glory to you in whatsoever we eat, whatsoever we drink, or whatsoever we do. Help us, Father, to realize that we are children that are a glorious temple that is to shine in this earth and to lighten the earth with your glory. Help us, Father, to behold, to go into the holy place ourselves, the most holy place ourselves, and to behold the Shekinah glory and to become changed in the same image, to recognize that we have entered into the most holy place by the blood of Jesus. And thank you, Father, for everything you do. Thank you for this beautiful time that we come together. I pray, Father, that you would continue to bless us all as we depart from this feast and give us all traveling mercies as we go back home. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Wow. How many was blessed with that one? How many are going to go home and catch these messages again? Amen. You know, David, you were talking about armies, and Carol and I have been studying. What, what, what really is an army? Does it have to be bullets and swords and knives and guns? Absolutely not. Armies, what did God use what, to run the people out of the land? Hornets. There are other people that can be armies, too. A body that consists of one mind to do one thing. That's an army. Better beware of some other armies that are out there because they can get to us. We've had a wonderful feast. We've had wonderful speakers. We just, what a message. I'd just like to say thank you to all of them. I, I thank you for our technical support up here. They've done a wonderful job, Sandy in the office, doing all these things for us. John, providing this campus for us to come to. This is awesome. We've got a place to come to. I just want to thank all the musicians. Some of us had to leave, but wow. It's awesome. Uh, me? I want to tell you something. John let me do a little of this in the fall last year. Uh, uh, if you'd have put a bucket under my feet, it would have filled it up. And when I started this time, It's awesome. John had such a blessing to share with you people. And I hope I've shared in his place. Amen. I love you people. I want to be there with you in heaven. We love you. Before we depart, let's have another word of prayer. Amen. Father in heaven, we have been blessed by the cooperation that John has brought us into through the message he was used as a vessel for you and this ministry, how it grew. We are so blessed by that. And Father, if, if there is more time, I pray that we will be able to gather together again and share these rich blessings and I just want to say thank you for all you people here at Terabella, but out there who are in the watching on, on the satellites in your
just say good night. Make one more announcement. If you're still here in the morning, we really need help taking camp apart. We got tents to take.